The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 11272 in the name of Jim Eady on the 35th anniversary of Mercy Corps. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Jim Eady to open the debate up to seven minutes please Mr Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I begin by thanking members from across the Chamber who have signed the motion in my name and who have stayed behind for the debate this evening. I'd also like to welcome the staff of Mercy Corps and the Edinburgh University Student Charity Group who have joined us in the gallery. Scotland is literally leading the world in international development through the work of Mercy Corps, whose European headquarters are based here in Edinburgh. As well as celebrating 35 years of one of the leading organisations in this field, the purpose of this debate is to focus attention on Scotland's impact and commitment to international development. Before focusing on the activities of Mercy Corps, I would like to pay tribute to some of the other leading actors in this field in Scotland. SCIAF, the official aid and development charity of the Catholic Church in Scotland, working in 16 countries across Asia, Africa and Latin America. Mary's Meals, who are feeding almost one million school children every day. Christian Aid Scotland, who are working globally to eradicate poverty and are one of Scotland's largest voluntary organisations, with 600 volunteer groups based in churches. Oxfam Scotland, who campaign for an end to poverty and to raise awareness of climate justice. As you can see, this sector is rich and varied, and at the helm is NIDOS, the network of development organisations in Scotland, who do fantastic work in promoting collaboration across the sector. Mercy Corps Scotland has a total income of over £45 million. Their Edinburgh office supports country programmes in 34 countries around the world. There are 40 people in their Edinburgh office who are employed as programme officers, international finance officers, compliance managers, as well as fundraisers who cover the broad spectrum of fundraising. Mercy Corps' work covers the range of activity from immediate disaster relief, such as providing urgent water, food and shelter in the Gaza crisis last year. And here it is worth noting that Mercy Corps has the largest humanitarian presence on the ground in Gaza after the United Nations, to immediate recovery, such as their Prevention of Child Soldiers programme in Colombia, or their Water and Sanitation programme in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which over the next five years will bring water to 1.5 million people. And ultimately through to resilience, such as their programme in Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. This programme is creating two eco-zones to strengthen capacity to withstand climate change. So far, 12 pilot projects have been implemented in innovative sustainable land management to address desertification, overgrazing, deforestation and water management problems. By combining these three areas of focus, immediate humanitarian response, rapid economic recovery and long-term resilience and self-reliance, Mercy Corps takes a distinct approach to international development work and creates a vehicle for lasting, sustainable improvement in people's lives. They innovate and use technology wherever possible, such as their programmes in Uganda, Zimbabwe and Indonesia, to improve food security. They are developing a suite of mobile-based products for smallholder farmers to provide them with market information and financial management practices to increase farm productivity. Mercy Corps often begins working in a country during a humanitarian crisis in which their immediate action saves lives and reduces suffering. Then, just as quickly, they extend their efforts to economic empowerment initiatives. In this way, they help communities rapidly recover from the crisis and also create mechanisms to increase their resilience to shocks and setbacks that are likely to recur. Mercy Corps takes a distinct approach to international development work and, simply put, where others see intractable problems, they are looking for opportunities for progress. They know that local people are the best agents of the fastest, most durable economic recovery, and that is why 93% of their staff is local to the countries in which they work. Closer to home, Mercy Corps has worked closely with a range of organisations through the Edinburgh Disasters Response Committee. Mercy Corps and EDRC have been running a Christmas appeal for the past six weeks. In previous years, with the generous support of the people of Edinburgh, they raised an incredible £430,000 for Haiti and a further £200,000 for Pakistan. Last year was an unprecedented year for the humanitarian field. The world now has the highest number of people displaced since 1945. The UN declared four of the world's humanitarian crises Level 3, the organisation's highest designation. 
They are Iraq, South Sudan, Syria and the Central African Republic. And these are all countries where Mercy Corps is working on the ground. 2015 is going to be a watershed year. March will see the fourth anniversary of the commencement of the conflict in Syria. And Mercy Corps currently has the largest DFID funded response programme in Syria. The rise in chronic crises is an area that Mercy Corps is working on as they continue their work on economic development in fragile and conflict-prone states. That is something we all have to pay attention to as the Ebola crisis in West Africa has shown. Complex emergencies are now impacting on longer-term development. And also this year, the current Millennium Development Goals will come to an end and new ones will be set. It is time to consider what should be the role of Scotland what can we do as a society to help? The Scottish Government's International Development Fund, and here I pay tribute to uh, International Development Ministers, past and present, has done great work in pursuit of the Millennium Development Goals. How then will they change to reflect the, evol the evolving development priorities? Presiding officer, we must pay more attention to complex emergencies which impact on development and the role of young people in that, recognising that unemployed and disenfranchised young people are critical to economic development and conflict resolution. I am proud that the Scottish Government, with cross-party support, has provided assistance to humanitarian emergencies over the last decade, fulfilling Scotland's role as a good global citizen. This has included the 2010 monsoon floods in Pakistan, the conflict in Syria, Typhoon Haiyan, last summer's crisis in Gaza, and most recently the struggle against Ebola in West Africa. I believe we need to develop a strategy to better respond to humanitarian crises in a more deliberate and proactive way. Mercy Corps and others have already been discussing how the Scottish Government responds to humanitarian crises, and we should consider how we formalise the process for triggering humanitarian aid and whether we set up a separate humanitarian fund. Scotland's impact on the world is not limited to its international development and aid policies, how Scottish companies operate internationally, the consumer choices people in Scotland make, and a whole range of other government policies, including energy, climate and procurement, all have a major global impact. We also need to mainstream gender equality and women's empowerment to all of our international development programmes and ensure that, and ensure that they are at the heart of development work in the areas of education, health and employment. In conclusion, presiding officer, let us congratulate Mercy Corps, whose projects over the last 35 years have improved beyond measure the lives of 229 million people in 115 countries across our planet. Let us pay tribute to all of the staff and volunteers who have made this work possible, and let us wish them well in the work that they do in the years ahead. Thank you very much. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by David Torrance. Uh, Presiding officer, I congratulate uh, Jim Media on bringing the motion to, uh, to the chamber and the opportunity to join him in recognising the truly global impact of Mercy Corps. In the 35th year of operation, it is right that we look back at their positive legacy in building resilient communities in times of crisis. As the motion points out, Mercy Corps are active within communities in more than 40 countries and are funded entirely through charitable donations. They work with a clear vision to build more sustainable solutions to the problems born of poverty, civil war, long-term economic hardship, religious persecution and social exclusion. The success of the charity lies in their extensive knowledge of the communities and their contacts at the grassroots, which help them to form supportive networks across sectors and build resilience. As they put it, Mercy Corps often enter during a humanitarian crisis, move rapidly to recovery and then build long-term resilience to recurring stresses. Understanding how these recurring stresses emerge depends on their presence and contacts within the community. In all the situations, the use of community-led solutions forms the heart of the Mercy Corps strategy. They do this using the emergency technologies of each developing country and give specific focus to promoting gender equality, recognising that doing so is an integral part of sustainable social and economic solutions. They do this in the face of truly glo global problems, poverty, conflict, weak governance, climate change, an increase in population and food insecurity are all cited in the strategic roadmap as both the cause of many long-term humanitarian crises and the barriers to tackling them. Two countries mentioned in the motion that I would like to touch on briefly are Haiti and Gaza. 
On January 12, 2010, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck Haiti. Many members will recall the devastating impact this had on the country, particularly in the capital of Port-au-Prince, where there were estimates of between 220,000 and 316,000 victims. Over 300,000 more people were injured. The Mercy Corps reps on the ground worked to ensure that the immediate needs of survivors, including food, water and post-trauma recovery, were addressed as a priority. This included 9.5 million litres of fresh water through water vouchers, purification tabs and high-capacity water filtration units. They also distributed more than 100,000 hygiene kits. Following this, they provided temporary jobs to more than 28,000 people who worked to clean up and begin rebuilding their communities. They also helped to restart the local economy by providing more than 180,000 Haitians with a cash transfer programme to purchase essentials for local markets. This action allowed something of normal life to return to residents who had been so badly traumatised. Uh, a second example, of course, uh, is Gaza, and the horrors of Gaza are fresh in everyone's mind after recent events. In the midst of that intense conflict and frequent bombing in civilian areas, Mercy Corps were on the ground distributing urgent supplies of food and water. They also distributed hygiene kits with essentials like soap, towels, toothbrushes and toothpaste, and heavy tarps that families could use as temporary shelter materials. They also held psychosocial sessions, and still do, I believe, which help children express their feelings after severe trauma and teach parents how to deal with signs of psychological stress. These happened before the two most recent wars, and they will continue as a key local service that is needed more with each year that passes. Presiding officer, these are just two examples of how the work of Mercy Corps varies according to the situation. The salient factor in all circumstances is that they are rooted within the community, a constant and stable presence that understands the complexities of towns, cities, regions and countries, and how to form local solutions. These local solutions can be built on year by year as a community heals. The scale of their ambitions and the scale of these achievements is truly remarkable, and I urge all members present and all absent members to visit their site and read the inspirational stories as well as watch the videos that come from, videos that come from around the world. I congratulate Jim Media again on bringing forward the motion, which I fully support. Thank you very much. And I now call David Torrens to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank Jim Eady for bringing this motion to the Chamber today and extend my congratulations to Mercy Corps in celebration of the 35th anniversary. Since its establishment in 1979, Mercy Corps has, through its various activities, made a real difference to an increasing number of people. Currently, the organisation is implementing projects in over 34 countries, ranging from warm tone regions such as Syria and Gaza to countries repeatedly hit by natural disasters in Haiti and Sri Lanka. Considering the devastating situation, Many people are faced with on a daily basis in these many other countries. I believe that we have a responsibility as an affluent nation to help. Having recognised its role as a modern global citizen, Scotland is committed to contribute to a fight against global poverty. I would like to express my solidarity with Malawi today, as the country was hit by severe floods last week. At least 176 people have died so far, more than 200,000 lost their homes, and continued heavy rainfall is forecast in the coming weeks. Malawi's, Malawi's president has appealed for international assistance as the catastrophe has hit one of the poorest regions in the world and the country itself is not able to counteract the immediate damage and put in place a plan to help the country to rebuild structurally and economically. Therefore, I welcome the help that the First Minister has offered this week. Besides providing desperately needed support in emergency situations, I believe that we should also look at the wider picture and address the issues involved in international development in the long term. In the recent years, some experts, such as Zambian born Dambese Moy, have tried to discredit the impact of international aid. Over the past 50 years, over one trillion in aid has been transferred to Africa alone. Though many Africans continue to live below substantial levels, this argument is controversial. However, it reminds us that international aid has to be scrutinised carefully if we want it to be sustainable. There are just some of the questions that may, must be asked. What are the purposes and the goals of international development? How and who should implement it? And what can, in what way can Scotland contribute to a just and fair world? Mercy Corps seeks to answer these and the similar questions on a daily basis. Thus, it created a framework of change which focuses on three main aspects, involving local communities, building on local markets and economics, assisting in developing good governance. 
Being aware of actively encouraging all stakeholders involved was identified as a key in securing sustainable change. But with our Mexico projects connect with civ civic society, with the private and public sector to create a secure, productive and just society. The organisations also tries to strengthen the ties between all participating parties, enabling them to interact effectively with each other while facilitating their engagement with the local popul population. Lastly, the organisation has also generated the ability to determine and truly understand the support needs of people in developing countries. The latter point has led to a focus on promoting self-empowerment by providing people in developing countries with the tools to shape their own futures. It is therefore important that we focus not solely on the aid budget, but on the overall impact of Scotland's actions on international development. Money alone cannot eradicate poverty. Instead, we should take a pro-development policy, coherent approach. This can be achieved by promoting equality, human rights and democratic governance in all our external actions, especially in the areas of economic and financial systems, trade and climate justice. President Officer, I am proud to say that even though Scotland is a small country, is committed to sharing its experiences on issues ranging from public finance, financial management to holding democratic elections and strengthening civil society. The Scotland and Mali Partnership, since it was established, has facilitated networking, promoted best practice examples and not least created many friendships across two geographically distant countries. Because of such achievements, I believe that it is important not only to consider what still has to be done, but also remind ourselves of the work that has been accomplished by Scotland Mamali Partnership and the Mercy Corps. There are many other organisations and volunteers that are contributing and continuing to strengthen Scotland's impact in the world. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention Pauline Caffrey and all others who have bravely volunteered to support the fight against Ebola in the affected regions of West Africa. Lastly, I want to congratulate Mercy Corps once more and wish its staff in Scotland, as well as all those in countries who work in partnership with Mercy Corps, continued success in their work. Thank you. I now call Cameron Buchanan to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to support my friend Jim Eadie's motion celebrating 35 years of Mercy Corps and to discuss international development and the valuable work that charitable organisations such as Mercy Corps undertake. Mercy Corps does a vast amount of work all over the world that makes a real difference to the lives of millions, as we have heard. But whilst we're discussing international development, I think it's important that this Parliament also acknowledges the work done by a number of other international non-governmental -government, organisations, such as Save the Children, CARE Care and Médecins Sans Frontières. The common link between these organisations is that through immense effort and dedication, they spread their impact and make a noticeable positive difference on a global scale. To make a lasting difference in international development, it takes more than donating large sums of money, as Mercy Corps know well. That they have helped improve the lives of 229 million people in 115 countries, from Afghanistan, Guatemala and Yemen, to Bolivia, Kyrgyzstan and Zimbabwe, is proof that they understand this and have applied it expertly. It appears that this all comes down to their core beliefs in communities as the best agents of their own change, local markets as the best engines of sustainable recovery, and good governance as the foundation of success. This last point, I think, is underlined by the fact that more than 88% of the resources at their disposal over the last five years have been put straight into programmes for those who are most in need in times of crisis. All of this, as well as the points made by some of my colleagues, make it clear that Mercy Corps sets an example in international development of which they are rightly proud. However, I think we should use this opportunity to draw attention to the excellent work done by some other international charitable organisations, one that comes to mind is Save the Children, who in 2013 helped 15.4 million children in their work across more than 120 countries. Their approach, with the help of artists, ambassadors and corporate partnerships, also make a lasting difference in international development. And in doing so, it sets another example of how a real difference can be made. Although there are many that I could choose from, the final example I'd like to draw particular attention to is Médecins Sans Frontières. They are, of course, very well known, but this is due to their success and dedication, which is why they deserve some of our attention tonight as we discuss the principles that underline the most successful charitable work. In the case of Médecins Sans Frontières, the underlying principles are independence, neutrality and impartiality. These values enable them to concentrate entirely on getting help to those who need it, wherever they are. In addition, they practice their policy that gaining the acceptance of local communities is the key to being able to perform their work effectively. 
This, it seems, is something they have in common with so many charitable organisations. Accordingly, presiding officer, it is most welcome that we've had this opportunity to discuss Mercy Corps and its wider achievement in international development. As many of my fellow members have touched on this evening, Mercy Corps has been a huge success and deserve much acclaim. One of the key messages that I hope we can take away from this debate is though that real progress is made in development when charitable organisations have at their core a set of principles that allow them to have a lasting impact on a global scale. These principles, including good governance, impartiality and promoting community-led and market-based initiatives, set an example that we in Parliament should applaud and many organisations, international organisations, should follow. Thank you. Many thanks. <clears throat> I now call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I too uh, am pleased to take part in this debate that has been put forward by my colleague Jim Eady. Also pleased to, to give due recognition to Mercy Corps, who for 35 years now we hear um, have been carrying out fantastic work um, all over Europe and, of course, um, all over the world. And their, their main headquarters is in Portland, Oregon. I first came across uh, Mercy Corps presiding officer some years ago. Uh, when I was, because they are quite quiet in what they do, they're not one of these organisations that we hear about all the time, they just seem to quietly go on with things. But I came across them some years ago when I was trustee of a, a charity which was called Just World Partners that dealt largely in the, the Southern Pacific region. And for various reasons, the, the charity had to be wound up. And Mercy Corps at the time came in and took over the projects, small projects took them over to make sure that the people that were the, the recipients of the work going on were not disadvantaged in any way. So I've always felt this was an organisation which um, prime um, motivation was to give help where help was needed, and we've heard that from others tonight. Um, I have a particular interest in Timor-Leste, and uh, Mercy Corps are doing a lot of good work there. Jimmy Day actually mentioned women's empowerment and ask that women's empowerment be at the centre of development. And um, Mercy Corps have done some work in Timor-Leste in women's empowerment um, and proving that um, child nutrition increases because of women's empowerment. And I would ask that if I pass that on to the minister, he'll have a look. It's interesting reading. But I particularly wanted to talk this evening about a, a scheme that's being done through the European Commission by Mercy Corps in Timor-Leste, which is the Energy for All programme. And they're doing this in the way they do many other things, most other things, which is partnering with local communities. And uh, this is not always an easy thing to do. It sounds like one of these buzz phrases that everyone uses. Yes, we partner with local communities. Um, quite often, it's not in fact the case, because it is difficult. Um, too often it becomes much, much easier to just get on and do things and have all the local people standing around watching you do it. And that was a, a problem that blighted international development for some time. And I think, you know, thankfully, we've got over that over the past couple of decades. But in Timor-Leste, um, they did very much partner with local communities uh, in this scheme, which was addressing the problems in Timor-Leste in relation to infrastructure. Um, infrastructure is bad there, um, but when you consider the scorched earth policy that the Indonesians left with after their independence referendum, it's not surprising. So you do have, in fact, only 38% of the just over a million population um, with electricity access, which is not always reliable. I, I can tell you that from, from experience. But in actual fact, in the rural areas, 90% uh, um, relied on kerosene until Mercy Corps came in and tried to make a difference here by provision of solar panels, partnering with small local companies, setting them up, um, providing microfinance where necessary and trying to, to make a difference in people's lives. We all know the problems of cooking uh, with wood fire open stoves, which most people in Tibor do, but also uh, trying to get lighting with kerosene. It's dangerous um, in health terms, as well as horrific fires that happen. Um, I could talk about this forever, presiding officer, um, and I've barely started with where I could go from here. But one thing that um, I did very much get from reading this fine report that was done is that Mercy Corps are very, very honest and upfront about achievement because they have headline lessons here in this report that they've included. 
and some of them are critical of themselves. And I think that's a very important thing for agencies to do. But one thing I would like to say that always irritates me, um, and they've hit the nail on the head here, market development programmes require longer and more flexible intervention timeframes particularly those in high-risk areas. Far too often we go in and we say, right, in three years we're going to make these wondrous changes. Sometimes three years isn't enough. Sometimes we have to look at 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years and be realistic about how long it takes a society to really turn themselves around and be able to do things for themselves. And can I say, just in closing, um, that uh, the reason I know um, that they have actually tried very, very hard to partner with the local communities in Timor is because I was speaking to some friends there um, and I got good and bad reports um, about what Mercy Corps are doing there. But that actually is proof that they're working because if everybody was saying they were fantastic, it'd be because they were just giving stuff away. So can I say well done to everyone at Mercy Corps for this project and particular thanks to those working on the ground in Dili and in all the rural areas of East Timor. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I add my congratulations to Jimmy Day, who has secured the debate this evening and whose interest in the subject of international development is recognised by us all. The 35th anniversary of Mercy Corps is something that we should celebrate, and in doing so, we recognise the excellent work that the organisation and its staff have done in those 35 years. And in doing so, of course, we recognise all those aid or organisations operating from Scotland too. The Jimmy D's motion recognises the bravery and commitment of the staff of Mercy Corps, the reach of the organisation and the effectiveness of the work they have done and continue to do. And he's right to highlight those aspects. I would, however, like to focus on a particular aspect of their work rather than look at their uh, perhaps expanded world view. In a, a previous member's debate in my own name, I drew attention to the plight of those displaced because of the conflict in Syria and made a plea that we should not forget the children of that conflict and the need to ensure that they were not deprived of an education. Now, this is an area of work that has been a real focus for Mercy Corps and one where they have made a significant contribution to. As we know, over three million people have been displaced from their homes in Syria and their neighbours in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey and Iraq are struggling and their own services are overstretched. Mercy Corps is working to support some 800,000 refugees and is a supporter of UNICEF's No Lost Generation campaign which tries to highlight the long-term problems of the 1.2 million children who are missing out. Missing out not just on an education, but on stability at a crucial point in their lives. Now, Mercy Corps has made a point of trying to assist adolescents in the refugee and host communities and has highlighted the isolation and lack of social support that these young people often suffer. The situation of girls is particularly difficult as they are often from conservative communities and become tied to their homes with no opportunity to acquire vocational skills or to become financially independent. I think it's important too to stress why this work is so important. And Mercy Corps makes the point that it's the choices we make in adolescence that influence the paths we follow in later life. But this cohort of young people is also likely to be the one that has to deal with the aftermath of this conflict. So if they are deprived of education, of life and work skills, of training and business and entrepreneurship and an understanding of community involvement and community life, then not only are they being deprived as individuals of those opportunities, but we're seriously limiting the opportunities for rebuilding Syria itself. It is, I believe, presiding officer, that important. So what can we do? Mercy Corps themselves have suggested a number of areas where additional help would make a difference. And I would want to highlight just one or two of those. I've mentioned previously that girls in this situation are often pressurised to stay indoors for their own safety and because they're expected to do the household chores. But crucially, they need safe spaces where they can be mentored, supported and encouraged to continue their education and to perhaps delay marriage and early pregnancy too. Secondly, I come back again to the issue of education. 
As we know, schools in host communities are really overstretched and there is a lack of clarity about things that we take for granted, like certification and accreditation. There are difficulties of language and stigmatisation. So more flexibility needs to be built into the system and communities need to be helped to understand the value that this can bring to their young people and to their country. Presiding officer, Mercy Corps is doing a fantastic job day in and day out, but it cannot do it alone. In this its anniversary year, it would be good to be able to say that this country, which values education so highly, is with you, Mercy Corps, in the job you're trying to do. And perhaps the Minister might consider ways in which the government's international development budget could assist. Presiding officer, Mercy Corps has branded its work in this area with the tagline, Syrian adolescents, their tomorrow begins today. We, all of us, should want to be part of ensuring that a brighter future for young Syrians is secured. And it is only by doing so that we can be part of helping to build a safe and stable Syria too. Yeah. Many thanks. And finally, in the open debate, Liam McArthur. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I uh, finally add my thanks to Jim Eady, uh, not just for the motion and for securing this debate, but I think for the, the passionate and eloquent way in which he set the tone and set the scene uh, for this debate. Can I join him and others in expressing my gratitude and the gratitude of my party uh, to uh, Mercy Corps for all that they do on behalf of some of the most needy uh, communities and people across the world. The team based here in, in Scotland, I think, should be a source of pride uh, for all of us in the work that they do in over 30 countries around the world is truly remarkable. I think Malcolm Chisholm was right to put his finger on the, the flexibility and the, the, the local solutions that Mer Mercy Corps um, uh, are, are uh, committed uh, to introducing. And I think that is uh, very much at the root of their uh, success, often moving from urgent recovery into longer term resilience, which I think has to be uh, the objective, ultimately, uh, of international aid. Um, uh, Linda Fabiani mentioned um, the, the, uh, the modesty of Mercy Corps, uh, and I think um, they would be at pains to point out that they are part of a, a wider effort, a wider uh, network, and I think we are truly blessed in uh, the efforts that uh, the very many organisations uh, do uh, on our behalf uh, internationally. Uh, but I, I think um, there is no doubt that that effort has never been more uh, necessary. We're seeing, I think, the highest number of refugees now uh, at any point, certainly since uh, the Second World War. I, I recall a debate, I think three years ago, again uh, led by uh, my friend Jim Eady, uh, on the, the, the crisis situation in Syria. A number of colleagues were participating in that. And at that stage, I think uh, it was uh, suggested that uh, the number of refugees coming out of um, the, the, uh, the conflict in Syria was the highest of any single uh, conflict. And obviously, nobody will need reminding that that situation uh, in, in that country has deteriorated uh, abysmally uh, since then. But while the pressure of numbers uh, clearly creates challenges, uh, it's not simply a, a, a numbers game. Mercy Corps have uh, made clear to me uh, in, in correspondence the challenges presented by what they call complex humanitarian uh, emergencies, where the impact of the conflict is very real, not just on those directly affected, but also, I think, those seeking uh, to deliver help uh, to those people and to those uh, communities. Um, I, I think David Torrance mentioned uh, the situation in, in Malawi, um, pointing up that this is not just about areas of, of conflict. That complexity comes from uh, natural disasters too. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I will be joining yourself and um, James Dorn in a visit to Malawi uh, next month. I think that is very timely um, to see for ourselves the effects of the, the floods, uh, both in terms of the immediate effects uh, in, 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 in disease risk, etc., but actually the longer term risks uh, to infrastructure uh, and the like. And I was very grateful to the First Minister for her words in response to Patricia Ferguson at First Minister's questions uh, last week. That commitment is greatly to be welcome. And I think follows uh, a long uh, uh, legacy of um, commitment to international development uh, that has been shown by uh, ministers of different political persuasions over the duration of this parliament. Uh, more recently, we've seen the reaction not just to Malawi and floods, but the hurricane Haiyan, um, to the uh, Ebola uh, situation in West Africa as well as conflicts such as Syria, uh, uh, Gaza 
and others. And the financial support, while important, I think a number of colleagues are absolutely right um, to point to the wider significance. Yes, it, it lends into the international aid efforts of the UK government. I'm particularly proud of the coalition's government's commitment to deliver that 0.7% of GDP and the wider international effort. But it's also uh, the expertise um, that we have available in Scotland and can deploy internationally. It's also the wider publicity um, that the actions of, of ministers and, and, and parliamentarians here can give to the efforts of Mercy Corps and others uh, who are seeking to raise that uh, awareness more widely. Looking forward, obviously, as we move from the Millennium Goals to the principles of leaving no one behind, I think there is a call for us to take a more strategic uh, approach to international aid. I think Jim Eady and others pointed to the, the principles of addressing climate change, gender equality, human rights and principles of, of democracy. All of these, I think, need to be fed through into our approach going forward. Forward. Although I would perhaps be a little bit wary of an approach that spread our, uh, uh, tried to spread our influence too widely, uh, as that may dilute it uh, ultimately. But can I conclude by thanking Jimmy D once again for allowing this debate to take place, congratulate Mercy Corps on their 31st anniversary, and wish, wish them all the very best in the desperately difficult but absolutely critical work that they do on our behalf. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. Can I now invite Hamza Yusuf to respond to the debate? Minister, around seven minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Jim Eady uh, for putting forward and securing this debate. I'm very pleased to speak in support uh, of it on behalf of the Scottish Government. In doing so, I, of course, wish uh, Mercy Corps a uh, very happy uh, 35th uh, birthday. Uh, I, I'm going to be turning 30 this year, actually, and uh, having a bit of a pre-30 crisis. Uh, so I might speak to Mercy Corps to see how they uh, adapted to being in their 30s. But congratulations uh, to them and to their staff and to uh, all the wonderful team that they have around them for everything that they've done in those 35 years, and I'm sure will con continue to do for many years in the future. It's a privilege in the, uh, for us as, as the government to have uh, the European headquarters of Mercy Corps, uh, such a large and prestigious organisation uh, based here uh, in Scotland. Not long after coming into my post, I was given a tour of their Edinburgh offices. I was very impressed by the dedication uh, and commitment of their, spa uh, their staff, especially those uh, who were planning to work through the Christmas period to provide help uh, for those who need it the most. And I'm delighted that I'll be visiting them again tomorrow. Uh, but I look forward to meeting their staff as well as their new chief executive, Simon O'Connell, who brings with him a wealth of experience and expertise uh, in developing countries for his new role. Uh, Jim Eady uh, was absolutely correct uh, in saying that uh, the world we live in today is afflicted with many challenges. I had, um, we had uh, the UK representative of the UNHCR up here uh, in Scotland just uh, last week speaking at the Scottish Refugee Council's uh, AGM. Uh, he spoke uh, of the refugee crisis that we're facing, uh, both Liam MacArthur and Jim Eady, uh, referring to it, uh, that 58 million people uh, in the world are for forcibly displaced, more than any other time, in history after the Second World War. Uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, I want to touch upon just a few points that were raised uh, among, uh, across the Chamber, if I may, Presiding Officer. Uh, first, uh, I want to commend Mercy Corps uh, for the work that they do in long-term resilience. Uh, Jim Eady also touched upon this and his contribution very eloquently. Uh, and what a lot of aid agencies will do that are uh, designed to uh, tackle and uh, to, to assist communities when it comes to, to natural disasters in particular and sometimes even within conflict is that they will go in uh, very well intentioned, do a lot of great work but then of course we'll have to move on to the next crisis, the next conflict, the next natural disaster and that's only un uh, that is very understandable and correct. Uh, what Mercy Corps do and what Jim Eady touched upon is some of that longer term resilience work uh, with local partners. He spoke about Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, and they are there in the long term, before disasters actually necessarily take place, but also making sure that after they do, then, then, then those disasters, uh, if they are repeated, will not have the same devastating consequences uh, again. So they're there often after the media spotlight has gone from that conflict or from that natural disaster, when many other aid agencies have pulled out, as I say, for understandable reasons, but Mercy Corps uh, are still there, and I think they should be commended for that long-term uh, resilience. I also want to touch upon a point that uh, Jim Meady raised about humanitarian aid. Uh, and I'm pleased the Scottish Government uh, has a good record in, in this regard in responding to uh, 
uh, humanitarian disasters, be it Gaza, Pakistan, Haiti, Syria, uh, most recently the Ebola uh, crisis as well. Usually the DEC is our, is our trigger for the Scottish Government to, 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 to put forward some uh, money and some funds towards uh, helping to tackle a crisis. Uh, that's not always the case. Ebola is an example. The DEC uh, moved on Ebola uh, after we'd already donated uh, significant money to the World Health Organization. Uh, a number of members mentioned the Malawi uh, floods, and I'll uh, make some, some announcements on that uh, very soon in regards to what support uh, we can give, and obviously there's not been a DEC trigger to that. There are ongoing discussions with Mercy Corps on how we set a criteria uh, for uh, a trigger for uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, the, the challenge we face is that we obviously don't have a set budget uh, within the Scottish Government for humanitarian aid. We uh, rely on not just the International Development Fund, uh, but the generosity of other departments within government to put something uh, forward. But I'm very sympathetic uh, to looking uh, further at this. I thought uh, Linda Fabiani spoke uh, incredibly powerfully uh, about her own experiences with Mercy Corps. I agree entirely with her point about sometimes that three years can, uh, doesn't seem enough of a time frame. I'm very sympathetic uh, to examining that and certainly something that internally uh, we're looking at as a government. I thought Patricia Ferguson uh, equally uh, powerful in her contribution uh, focusing on Syria. And um, I thought she, she made a good point that aid is, of course, important, but we can do more than, than just aid. And I think on the education front, I'll be more than happy, uh, of course, to, to see what Mercy Corps have, perhaps, in my discussions with them tomorrow, what plans, what, what, what they're doing in regards to education in Syria, and seeing where we might be able to assist uh, in that regard. I'm very keen that uh, the entire Scottish Government plays a role in international development. It's not just seen as an international development uh, department. Uh, uh, a challenge, but also it's seen as a cross-governmental uh, priority uh, for all of us. So it's certainly something that I'm happy to uh, take up with the Education uh, Secretary. Uh, just on her point on Syria, I think also uh, we could be doing uh, a lot more in regards to the refugee crisis. 3.8 million people, uh, or Syrians, are, are now refugees. Uh, and I commend the work that the UK government has done in terms of uh, delivering aid. In fact, the UK government uh, is the second largest aid donor uh, to Syria, so they should be commended uh, for that. But I would uh, urge them to go further in regards to the refugee crisis. Uh, with thus far, uh, many European countries have taken tens of thousands of refugees. Uh, the UK government's own uh, vulnerable persons relocation scheme uh, has thus far only resettled uh, 140 uh, Syrians. So we can do more, and Scotland is ready uh, to play her part as well. In regards to, to Mercy Corps' uh, work, uh, they have a long-standing relationship uh, with the Scottish Government uh, presiding officer. Uh, one of the projects uh, that I've been uh, involved in and seen the fruits of uh, is their project in, in Kashmir, uh, where uh, the Kashmir, as all the members will know, uh, an area and a region that has been blighted by conflict and instability for many, many years. 48% uh, of young people are unemployed. Uh, Mercy Corps received £400,000 of Scottish Government funding to deliver a programme to encourage entrepreneurship over a three-year period and young entrepreneurship. Uh, in particular, the programme ran an awareness campaign that reached over 38,000 young people, alerting them to the possibilities of setting up a new business. It was a phenomenal response that they received back and providing 170 young people directly with finance uh, they, uh, and advice they needed to start up their own business. The project has helped to harness uh, creativity, enthusiasm uh, and entrepreneurship. And I, when I visited India in October 2013, I had uh, the pleasure of meeting a couple of those entrepreneurs uh, myself. Uh, many other uh, projects that we've uh, helped, and uh, with Mercy, Mercy Corps' assistance, we've helped to make a difference as a Scottish Government, just touching on the issue of uh, gender uh, equality, uh, which I thought was well made by Jim Eadie and also picked up by Linda Fabiani. Uh, we know that there's far too many maternal deaths, too much infant mortality uh, in the developing world, and one of the projects we deliver with Mercy Corps in the Balochistan uh, region of Pakistan, looks to empower uh, community midwives. I'm very, very proud of that and of all the projects uh, that we work uh, closely with Mercy Corps with. So finally, presiding officer, I'd just like to conclude by referring to Mercy Corps' mission statement to alleviate suffering, poverty and oppression by helping people build secure, productive and just communities uh, in a world where suffering, poverty uh, and oppression are sadly all too commonplace. Uh, Mercy Corps serves as an inspirational example of how one organisation can make a difference. I commend this motion uh, and I'm pleased to support it on behalf of the Scottish Government.
Thank you, Minister. That concludes Jimmy Day's debate on the 35th anniversary of Mercy Corps, and I now close this meeting of Parliament.